Midnight lovers, all of them neath the covers, but no one got no sleep. I was laying in my bed a few hours ago and a recollection came back to me. From when I had worked at my last job for about six months and they had moved me to third shift. I got accustomed to the shift and what the nightly schedule was like. I worked alone with one other guy who took a full hour break each night and went and slept somewhere way in the back of the room in a corner where there was little activity and he was out of sight behind great big tape racks. The room was a secured area and very large and at night if offered plenty of privacy. I was on a third shift schedule which meant I got to spend very little time with my girlfriend at the time and when we were together it seemed like our moods never matched up. So one night I was feeling very horny. I had worked there on first shift for three months before third and there were a couple of hot girls that sat at a desk in the room. I had already worked myself up a bit so I went over to a chair where this hot chick sat and pulled out my throbbing red cock and started rubbing it on the chair where I knew she sat during the day. Needless to say it didn't get me off, but it worked me into a fury of horniness. I went to the computer with internet access. At this time it was a shared logon thing so the twenty some people who worked in our group used the same it and password for one computer. I searched around for some scantily clad pictures of women and eventually found one of Clove Jones in a wet see-through blouse. I grabbed a snatch of brown paper towel from a roll that was nearby and spanked it until I dished my fuck into it. I buried the paper towel into the trash can near a table and cleared the internet history. Immediately after I felt a bit guilty and afraid I'd get caught. That was the rush though I think. That chair or the picture of Chloe wasn't the stimulus per se. I think it was the idea of taking the chance to do it. I mused to myself that morning as I went to sleep that all those people were walking by my babies at the bottom of that trash can. This got me thinking of other similar type situations, things I'd never told anyone, but done to get off and were sort of risky. There are several I thought of right off the bat. Like when I was younger and staying for a few days with my friend who had an older sister, she wasn't the most attractive girl, but she was older and very sexual. She'd often tell me that she'd never settle down with a man unless he was her match in the bedroom. A couple of different times when we were alone in the house he'd go take a shower and I'd steal off into his sister's room and grab a pair of her panties out of her top drawer. The excitement of the journey alone had me hard and once I had the silkiest pair I could find I'd rub it on my erect cock almost to the point of coming. Then I'd put them back where I'd found them and no one was the wiser. Another time, well several times actually, at my ex-girlfriend's house. I'd go into her younger sister's room and raid her panty and sock drawer. Her sister was gorgeous, as was she. She never kept her drawers in that good of order so I had a heyday grabbing out panties and rubbing my throbbing staff all over the parts that I'd known would touch her naughty bits. I'd also take out some of her clean socks and rub my cock all over them inside and out. Always stopping before the rush of orgasm hit often resuming the activity once I'd regain control. I'd do the same with my girlfriend's drawer. Then on the nights when I'd stay over and she was being cold I'd be sleeping on the floor of her room. One night I got up when she was fast asleep, and she slept like a rock. I got up and uncovered her feet from the blankets. Hard from the anticipation of being naughty I started rubbing the shaft of my pecker on her feet. The soles, arches, and toes. She turned over and my stomach nearly dropped out of my ass. Then I grabbed one of the socks she'd taken off that night and started rubbing my cock on it and putting my dick inside it and rubbing the fabric right under the head until I shot off and made a bootcock sock out of it. I buried it in the bottom of her laundry basket and she never even knew. I think it'd be hilarious to tell her now though. When I recalled this one I thought it was the best. On a day when I was watching my ex's house while they were away on a family trip I went into her sister's room again. I must have been bored with the usual so I spotted a pair of pantyhose I'd seen before. I'd also noticed there was a gaping hole in the crow's nest of them. I did the rubbing thing and somehow came up with the idea to take them up to the living room and put them on myself and stick my cock through the hole at the crow's nest and jack off into a tissue. Funny how these things lose the glamour once you've busted a nut off. 
Afterwards I felt stupid, but now I think it's a gas. Another time at work third shift, I was down in the cafeteria area smoke room. Once in a while a capital police officer would come through there at night, but not often. I was sitting at a table that I remembered a good-looking blonde woman usually sat at during break's first shift. The thing that was the turn on here was she was always taking her shoes off or had sandals on with her heels and arches showing and crossing her legs and bouncing the top one up and down under the table mesmerizing me like that with those clean white socks. So here I was alone at the table where she sat and I was mega hard. I whipped it out and started madly stroking and came in nearly 10 seconds, spilling my love knock onto the floor where she was liable to wave that magic foot over it making four sweet dreams for me the next day. Crouching they got hidden dildo. Being single and meeting women is hard for a guy. Especially one who is more socially reserved. I've had numerous follies in the way of meeting someone by taking less conventional methods. For example my dateline period about four years ago. This is one of the worst ways ever to meet a remotely attractive girl. At the time I figured there were probably attractive girls locked away in their houses looking for someone and soon realized every woman on there is either a trying to get a laugh at all the pathetic dorks leaving them messages be completely honest about being ugly and desperate for any kind of male attention or see desperate and ugly and completely lying about their appearance. This one service I used 256 date I made a recording on ad free sending and receiving messages for men between 4 and 5 p.m. happy hour on weeknights. Women however can use the service free anytime. Otherwise a guy had to buy minutes to send and listen to messages any other time of day. Although when you got a message it would say the user's number and you could check their profile and listen to other people profiles as much as you wanted. In the first week I sent messages to girls who described themselves as someone who I'd be attracted to and left messages for them during happy hour. I'd check my inbox and would get a few usually really nasty sounding ones, but no replies. Then one day I got a reply from one I left to a girl named Carrie. She described herself as having long blonde hair, blue eyes, average body, and being 5 foot 6 inches tall. When I listened to the message her voice sounded nice and she left her home phone number right away, which should have ticked me off. Although it saved me the hassle of having to fuck with at the hour or use the minutes which I shamefully admit I'd thought. I got her message at lunch at work and called her back the same day. We had a pretty good conversation and both seemed to get along. Long story short I hinted we should meet. Another since realized red flag went up. She wanted to meet that night after I got off work. She suggested she'd cook dinner at my apartment for me. Some kind of famous homemade pizza, to which I thought sounded good. I lived alone at the time so no bother if I ended up bending her over the kitchen table. I had high hopes for her looks. I kind of pictured her as a hot little strawberry blonde. If not she'd be tolerable enough to try and beg and go back to the dateline for another. When I went to her apartment complex to pick her up she guided me in while I was on my cell phone. She said, can you see me? I'm on the balcony. I looked up and my excited nervousness turned to complete panic and disappointment. Even from a distance I could tell this would be a girl who I couldn't even cut down for her looks. But one I'd feel pity for. Her. I wanted to call it off, but didn't want to hurt her feelings. Well, honestly, I would have sped off if she hadn't been on the phone. She headed down to meet me and I got out. She immediately hugged me and told me that she thought I was really hot. I just said thanks and not much else. On the way to my apartment, we had to stop for a pizza pan and ingredients. I was ashamed to be seen with her and my mind was racing trying to come up with a believable excuse to call it off. She kept asking why I was so quiet over and over. That's how I am, I told her. I am quiet by nature, but this was awkward anxiety quiet. I finally just decided to go through the motions and consider her company for the evening, just company. Seeing her in my apartment was depressing. I kicked myself for not thinking it through more. Not having a back door to skip out of, no fallout plan. She was a horrid beast, 
Just a hop, skip, and a jump away from primordial ooze itself. Frizzy hair which was more dishwater than blonde, no neck at all. Her body was shit, average all right, average for a Teletubby. And with that face her mom needed to tie a stake around her neck to get the dogs to even play with her. This chick was all out repulsive, just bad genes. Her parents should have stepped down her after one look as a newborn. As if it couldn't get any worse for this slow deadly excuse for a woman she was psycho on top of it. While waiting for dinner she told me sob stories of how she was in and out of treatment for depression and it has attempted suicide. She apparently needed more practice though. The pizza she made was pretty poor too, but I did my best to fake liking it. Then after we ate it was time to sit down at her insistence to brush my hair. She actually made my tension a lot easier by saying she was really into me and asking what I thought about her. I told her honestly that I wasn't attracted to her, but I thought she was nice and we could be friends. She seemed disappointed, but with that out things got easier for us to talk and I pulled out a picture album. Paging through it she kept wanting out friends of mine who she thought were hot and asking if they were single. When we got to my Uncle Andy's picture I explained he had never even had a real girlfriend and was actively looking. She insisted I call him and ask him if he'd like to meet her. So I call and tell him that Carrie saw his picture and wanted to meet him and ask him try her pizza. They talked and she falsified her description again to him and told her she thought he was cute. They decided her and I would stop by to visit him before I dropped her off. I felt bad for trying to pawn this one off on poor Uncle Andy, but I figured he may just be desperate enough. If not, someone else needed to experience my shame and horror. I saw the horror in his face when I introduced her when he looked at me quizzically. The funny thing is his dog must have sensed how he felt and she constantly growled and nipped at her when she tried to pet or feed her. And the end I went out back of his house for a cigarette and she didn't smoke so she stayed inside. I explained the story and plead guilty to being an evil bastard for pawning her off. I guess he owes me one. We ended up playing you know for a couple hours, during that time she asked him what he thought of her. He didn't do as well as I'd done because he ended up taking her phone number and promising to call her. Finally I ended our misery by announcing I was tired and was going to take her home. She hugged him and made him promise over and over that he'd call. On the way home she was all excited about him and relentlessly asked me if I thought he'd really call. I dropped her off and swore I'd never use that infernal date line ever again. Finally realizing any decent woman gets hit enough in real life they have their pick. I was just happy it was over. Three days later I got a call on myself from her number and I let it go to voicemail. She called to let me know after I dropped her off she overdosed on some kind of pills and had just got out of the hospital. Then she said to have Andy call her. After that she called once or twice saying I should tell him she didn't appreciate being lead on. Finally the call stopped and I assume that all that practice suicide made perfect. Overall it was a learning experience and I look back on it and laugh. Not my proudest day in the least, but I made it through unscathed. Older men who are horny should be together with other men who are lonely. It's human nature to do something that you're told not to. It's also natural to become fascinated by something that is kept secret. So naturally I have a fascination with a woman's menstrual flow. I've wanted for a long time to witness a girl changing her plug. After she's got the used one out I want to inspect it, smell it. More than that I want to open it up so it looks like a flower and wear it on my shirt like those support our troops ribbons. Even more than that I want to take it and after I opened it like the red flower, I want to jack off into the little cup shape and see my white gooey juices intermingle with that lovely cunt blood. I mentioned that to a friend's girlfriend at my last party and she laughed and said she'd think of me every time she changed the plug from that moment on. That made my night. I often asked my ex if she'd mind giving me a used tampon to keep and she thought it was gross. I feel damn left out, why does it have to be so secret and forbidden? I've had sex with several girls near the end of their periods and also had my red wings. Yet I want to taste while the flow is at its peak. 
I want to suck clod after humongous clod right out of that bloody hole and nibble on them. Hell if they're worried about a mess I can do it over the toilet or I'll buy some rubber sheets. Just get over my face and let it all ooze in. Does it even ooze? See I wanna understand the mechanics of this thing better. Anyway that'd be pretty damn hot to look in the mirror and see menstrual blood and clots all stuck in my goatee and giving me a puss blood mustache. I'll have my own ad campaign like the milk mustache one except instead of god milk, it'll be god flow. Where was I? Oh yeah I'd also love to have my cock inside that heavy menstruating cunt and have that shit all just running down my balls drippy all over the place. I've seen my dick with a bit of menstrual blood on it, but it wasn't the volume I'm talking about here. Why is that considered so gross? All these women saying they never have sex during their periods, shame on them. If my dick bled every 28 days I'd still be fucking during it. I mean the only time I've ever been grossed out by anything to do with menstruation is when I lived at home and the family dog would dig my mom or sisters used maxi pads out of the bathroom garbage and shred them and I'd be the only one home to clean up the mess. Yet I was only grossed out because I'd be touching something that was next to my mom's sloppy pussy hole. It did make me curious about the taste. I mean it had to be somewhat flavorful if the dog would dig it out of the garbage so often when their food dishes were empty. Menstruating or not I've always loved the aroma of a pussy. That aroma seems to intensify during a girl's period. Damn I wish I had my nose buried in that shit right now. I sort of have a sixth sense when it comes to guessing when a bitch is on the rag. For example on one occasion a friend of mine's girlfriend was secretively talking to another girl and after she got back he asked what it was all about. I immediately chimed in, she was borrowing so and so plug, his girlfriend looked at me in amazement and asked how in the world I'd known. I slyly replied, I know things about menstruation. I also added that she and her friends should be more open about it and it's not something to be ashamed of and that I'd gladly take the used specimens. They thought I was joking, but I wouldn't have hesitated. This inspiration for this entry is thanks to some cunt that is currently menstruating. If she lived closer I'd be there to kiss that puss for her and suck down some of that heavy flow and clotting. She thinks my fascination is cute and she'd be willing to grant me some of my much sought after experimentation. Who knows maybe it would lose the glamour after I'd actually got to fulfill the fantasy. Sometimes fantasies are much better than reality as they say and are better left as fantasies. Why Don Juan dead off across the road? His dick was stuck in the dead baby that was stapled to the chicken. My mind is and always has been a jumbly fuck of random mixed thoughts. The only of which that are related are sexual ones which make for about 75% of said thoughts. Now I'd run out of entertaining anecdotes there's really nothing I can write in here that would even tie together as an entry. I certainly won't make short factual daily updates for example, went to breakfast at Denny's today it was good. Went to the mall with Jane, we had fun. Hot topic is cool. Etc, etc. No I'd rather like to write some of the jumbly fuck down. Sex is on my mind forever and always. The only time I'm not thinking of it totally is when I'm satisfied. And that never even lasts too long. People see themselves growing old and planting a garden or being Mr. Fix-It, starting a family, bodybuilding, whatever. Myself, I worry about if I'll be getting it at least three times a day. Will my wife suck dick? Will she swallow? Blah blah may buy a house so I have some place to fuck after I come home from work, but fuck improving it. Maybe you love swing in the den, but fuck the rest. At work I always check out every hot bitch by instinct. Then catch myself and stop. Then my inner monologue chimes in with H-E-L-L-O-O nurse. Or if her perfume or body lotion smells good it chimes with a smells good like hot TW80 should. That inner voice is that kind of tone you'd use for a sleazy pickup line right before the girl slaps you and turns her nose up as she walks away all put off. And if I can get away with it I say it under my breath. But yeah I've been on the nurse kit lately. Every slut is a hot nurse. A nurse for any and every situation. One in the pouring rain, hello what nurse. Good looking tramp mowing the yard, hello one nurse. 
Going in the back door of the vet clinic. Hello animal nurse. Nurse is here, nurse is there, a nurse for every situation. I'm not a phone person, or any kind of conversationalist for that matter. Especially with women, but on the phone it's worse. First of all I take very little seriously. My job maybe and a few other things, but otherwise I joke a lot and consider nothing sacred. It makes it hard to talk to a girl on the phone they want to talk about work or school, maybe their pet rabbit and they want sympathy. I give what I have to, hopefully to have the conversation lighten. Then I have an opening for what's really on my mind. So what are you wearing? And they damn well better remember to mention the footwear, pair or socks feet. They always try to dig deep in my mind and get to know me with things like, tell me about yourself. Um, well, I like to funk. Because well, that's about as deep as I go. They already know enough about me that they called, like similar interests, friends, and shit. What the fuck else is there? Sex. They all try and say that they are hornier than I am, but then why can't we talk mostly on the phone about sex? They're always amused at first, but the novelty wears off I guess. Bitch quit talking and just fucking suck. Oh you sad? Crying because that rap just died? Well I got something you can dry your eyes with. Here my nutsack bitch. Mmm and daddy like. I'm really also judgmental when it comes to women I'm not attracted to. In my head at least, some people would say I'm mean. For instance this fat slut at work who comes in to visit with the blue shirts in the next room who have the facilities guys. Apparently she's pregnant. I'd never have messed with the pest cuts she's already got. Anyway this hag is always going on about baby shit. I just want an ear on the belly so hard she has a miscarriage on the spot and then I'll squish the little clump into the carpet while I say something really spiteful. The miracle she should be spouting about isn't the miracle of life. It's the miracle that she found someone who could stand to hang his pecker in her long enough to get off without vomiting profusely all over her dumpy run-down ass body. I hope she brings it in after it's born and I'll accidentally drop a case of paper on it. Whoops. Sorry, but at least it stopped crying. Have I made my point yet? I'm like that with ugly bitches. If she was a hot slut I'd be like H-E-L-L-O a pregnant nurse. Well there's a little slice of what's on my mind. I'm glad we had this chat. Until we meet again, don't let your meat loaf. I certainly never do mine. Some employees never die they just smell that way. Sex is on my mind forever and always. The only time I'm not thinking of it totally is when I'm satisfied. And that never even lasts too long. People see themselves growing old and planting a garden or being Mr. Fix-It. Starting a family, bodybuilding, whatever. Myself, I worry about if I'll be getting it at least three times a day. Will my wife suck dick? Will she swallow? Blah blah may buy a house so I have some place to fuck after I come home from work, but fuck improving it. Maybe a love swing in the den, but fuck the rest. At work I always check out every hot bitch by instinct. Then catch myself and stop. Then my inner monologue chimes in with H-E-L-L-O-O nurse. Or if her perfume or body lotion smells good it chimes with a smells good like hot TW80 should. That inner voice is that kind of tone you'd use for a sleazy pickup line right before the girl slaps you and turns her nose up as she walks away all put off. And if I can get away with it I say it under my breath. But yeah I've been on the nurse kit lately. Every slut is a hot nurse. A nurse for any and every situation. One in the pouring rain, hello wet nurse. Good looking tramp mowing the yard, hello lawn nurse. Going in the back door of the vet clinic, hello animal nurse. Nurse is here, nurse is there, a nurse for every situation. I'm not a phone person, or any kind of conversationalist for that matter. Especially with women, but on the phone it's worse. First of all I take very little seriously. My job maybe and a few other things, but otherwise I joke a lot and consider nothing sacred. It makes it hard to talk to a girl on the phone they want to talk about work or school, maybe their pet rabbit and they want sympathy. I give what I have to, hopefully to have the conversation lightened. Then I have an opening for what's really on my mind. So what are you wearing? 
and they damn well better remember to mention the footwear, pair or socks feet. They always try to dig deep in my mind and get to know me with things like, tell me about yourself. Um well, I like to funk. Because well, that's about as deep as I go. They already know enough about me that they called, like similar interests, friends, and shit. What the fuck else is there? Sex. They all try and say that they are hornier than I am, but then why can't we talk mostly on the phone about sex? They're always amused at first, but the novelty wears off I guess. Bitch quit talking and just fucking suck. Oh you sad? Crying because that rap just died? Well I got something you can dry your eyes with. Am yeah, I not sack bitch? Mm -hmm -hmm and daddy like. I'm really also judgmental when it comes to women I'm not attracted to. In my head at least, some people would say I'm mean. For instance this fat slut at work who comes in to visit with the blue shirts in the next room who have the facilities guys. Apparently she's pregnant, I'd never have guessed with the press cuts she's already got. Anyway this egg is always going on about baby shit. I just want to knee her on the belly so hard she has a miscarriage on the spot and then I'll squish the little clump into the carpet while I say something really spiteful. The miracle she should be spouting about isn't the miracle of life. It's the miracle that she found someone who could stand to hang his pecker in her long enough to get off without vomiting profusely all over her dumpy run down ass body. I hope she brings it in after it's born and I'll accidentally drop a case of paper on it. Whoops. Sorry, but at least it stopped crying. Have I made my point yet? I'm like that with ugly bitches. If she was a hot slut I'd be like H-E-L-L-O a pregnant nurse. Well there's a little slice of what's on my mind. I'm glad we had this chat. Until we meet again, don't let your meat loaf. I certainly never do mine. You promised to love me yet you disobeyed now welcome to death and your new black lilith grave. I was put to the challenge the other night when a dear friend asked me to tell her a story. I proceeded to tell her a story about bloodies on the orgies and necro STDs. That wasn't the challenge, I could write a million stories about necrophilia and incestuous grandmother on granddaughter sex. She mentioned something about how it'd be weird to hear me tell a happy pretty story. Well the last thing I want to be is a Johnny One Note, so I quickly came up with what follows, it's kind of a satire on a fairy tale. Once upon a time there was a lonely young man who lived alone and looked in the mirror each day and asked himself why such this tiny lad could be so alone and loveless. One morning as he did this a magical swirling appeared in his mirror. When the swirling and token swirling sound stopped there appeared a beautiful blonde fairy type staring back at him. He splashed water on himself in a dazed fashion and was frightened. But the fairy girl who had such an endearing countenance he couldn't help but be drawn closer to the mirror. The fairy addressed the young man. She said that her name was Michelle and she was from a princess from the magical realm of the fairies. Anyway the princess told the man that mirrors were the windows from fairyland into his world and that she had been watching him every day for a long time. She told him that she had fallen in love with him. But she was so distraught that her father the fairy king had betrothed her to the evil prince of the goblins because the goblin king had her father under a vicious spell. The young man immediately felt the connection between the two of them. He asked the princess how he might be able to help break the spell and vanquish the evil king and his vile son. The princess told the young man that he must first obtain the nectar form a flower of a rare tree called the Kender which conveniently grew in both worlds and also conveniently was in bloom. They both would drink nectar obtained by each of them in their respective realms and place their lips in a kiss on the mirror at which time the man would cross over and be able to vanquish the evil duo. The princess then promised the man that her father would see the valiance of his deed and allow them to marry. She also promised him eternal life, magical powers beyond his wildest imagination and that he'd be able to get his hands on her huge tracts of land. So our hero set out on his quest for the distressed and gorgeous Princess Michelle. Having no idea where to find this rare and powerful tree he ran down the road and yet again conveniently spotted a Mexican vendor with a stand selling rare and powerful nectars and herbs. 
After an arduous bartering process with the greasy little man he walked away with the kinder nectar and what the man told him was a powerful fairy aphrodisiac for a dollar fifty. He ran at top speed to his lonely apartment and dashed into the bathroom. Michelle was still there waiting with tears running down her beauteous face conveniently with the nectar as well. Fear not, he told her, I have found the blessed nectar, she was ecstatic and insisted they waste no more time and they both drank the nectar. The taste was overwhelming and it made the man delirious and he lost his balance for a second. He conveniently regained control after a minute and they both pressed their lips to the mirror. In a flash he was standing there in a loving embrace with his fairy love. The kiss was so magical that everyone in fairyland got a happy-go-lucky feeling and knew that the kingdom was out of danger. A love so strong would conquer any evil no matter how ugly and repressive. Just then the foul prince and his vile and ugly father entered the chamber to seize the maiden in an evil goblin type of idiom. Conveniently for our hero there was a spell book and a magic wand nearby which he sized in a fury. He cursed at the rotten bastards for messing with his woman and her beloved father, putting their beautiful kingdom in peril typical of this kind of situation. Quick! Shouted the princess, top 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 turned the page and I number signed ours tilde, silly of the princess not to realize that numbers were different in the human world. The prince and the evil king advanced in a slow motion type of pace saying words that couldn't be mentioned here since they were said also in a slow motion manner. The princess realizing her folly pulled out a human to fairy number cheat sheet he had conveniently in her garter also in a slow motion manner. Hurry, shouted our hero, the fiends advance at a slow motion pace, yet they still advance. The suspense was killing him. Then things snapped to real time and the princess told him, page 45, he quickly turned to the said page 45, not going to the latter number of 46, but the aforementioned number of 45. Because we all know what's on page 46, don't we? He read the directions and did as the book told him. All the while the evil scoundrels advanced, but conveniently this was a large chamber. He raised the wand and said the magical phrase, Funk 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 a duck, screw a kangaroo, finger bang an orangutan support your local zoo. And asterisk to fast risk almost at once two of the foulest beings in creation were turned into two of the foulest quadriplegic midgets in creation. When this happened the king conveniently snapped out of his spell and announced to the kingdom that our hero and the lovely princess Michelle were to be married that night. Right after the evil king and prince midget were paraded through town so the villagers could all mock them and throw feces and rotten eggs at them before banishment into the tall tower with all the other crippled midgets. Our hero and the lovely fairy princess were wed that night and the town had a gay festival to celebrate. Us, conveniently living happily ever after. Oh by the way on page 46 was the explanation why the princess couldn't have just got off her fat, lazy spoiled ass and turned them into crippled midgets herself, but we won't get into that now. The end. The tortures of the habit. I have come to know a woman of whom I will refer to as my confidant. We are both sexual sadists. When she was a young girl she attended a Catholic school. There were a group of nuns who singled her out and sexually brutalized her. We took to the task of tracking each of them down secretly and abducting them. What follows is a catalog so to speak of the manner in which we treated each of them. The first bitch was brought into a room with no windows. In the middle of the room sits a stool and above the stool hangs a noose. Next to the stool on the floor sits a large metal blade. Tied to one leg of the stool is a nylon rope leading to another chair in which I sit naked. My confidant treats her with relentless brutality, removes her clothing, and leads her up onto the step stool and places the noose around her neck tightly securing her. Her hands are free. This game is called cut the rope. The rules are explained to our guest. She is handed the blade. I am to be frigged and sucked by my confidant and at the moment I reach orgasm I will pull the rope tied to the stool and if her reflexes are fast enough she needs to cut the rope at the exact moment the tension takes otherwise it will be impossible to save her own life. She is also promised she will be released if she can free herself without any further harm to keep her from attacking with the blade if she were to get free. We begin, I am first sucked lusciously, 
my confidant takes every effort to bring me to my peak and then backs off as my body signals its readiness to flow my foot deep down her throat. The nun whimpers and cries as she watches this debauchery. Her cries only succeed in exciting us more. My confidant assumes the task of ridding me in lovely manner so she can watch the terrified woman. She touches herself and her cunt drips a lovely warm coos all over my leg. The nun's arm shakes as she holds the blade poised for her part in our play. Once again I am sucked furiously. I grasp the rope tight, my feet begin to tingle, I push my confidant aside and rise from my chair. A look of terror consumes our entertainment and I scream out at the top of my lungs as I pull this tool out from under me for. At that moment my warm creamy goo flies nearly two meters and covers the nun's thigh. Tension takes in the rope tied to her neck and she was too late to cut it at the exact time. She flails helplessly trying to cut it, but there is no hope. Seeing her in this helpless state Ray arouses my senses. I demand that my confidant assume a position next to me to mutually masturbate each other. We are now her god. We watch our pulpit and both orgasm again at the moment she perishes. As to risk note, the rest of these accounts will be shortened up and only the needed detail will be included. They follow the same pattern of sexual acts performed during the tortures and at the moment of death for the poor race. Second cunt is tied in the attic with chains. The chains are fashioned around her neck so when we place food just out of her reach she chokes herself nearly to death trying to reach it. Watching this give us great inspiration for our mutual pleasures. Two weeks into the ordeal she is perishing away, by willpower alone she is still alive. She begins to sustain herself on her own feces. After a while of this, her turds begin to diminish she perishes finally, much to our delight. The third wench is laid into a pasture and mounted on a four-legged wooden structure so that her ass is exposed high in the air. The secretions of a marine are gathered and smeared upon the buttocks of the wretched bitch. A snorting stallion is led into the pasture and upon getting a whiff of the fair, his immense horse cock immediately springs to attention. It is giant compared to her small frame. The stallion mounts and the nun screams echo through the valley. Upon thrusting his device into her she is immediately ripped in half. The fourth and final nun is brought to a clearing in a forest. She is tied tightly by each appendage with ropes between two large trees. A pack of snarling wild dogs are led into the scene on chains. The dogs have not been fed into days. Scraps of red meat and steaks are draped about her body while she is still half-dressed and torn and tattered attire that is suitable for a nun. The hounds are taunted and then released. They rip her to shreds biting every single inch of her body and tearing all of her clothes the rest of the way off in the process. This continues for nearly half of an hour. The dogs subside and reveal a horror of a sight. Her head falls back and she chokes on her own blood. Hungry for some Fumunda cheese aren't you? Add cheese fun into my sweaty nutsack. Right now I'm in the process of looking for a lawyer over that little bicyclist incident. I went to the pretrial hearing and they are offering me a shitty deal. Two years probation, alcohol and other drug classes, 100 hours of community service, an apology letter, and costs if I plead guilty to endangering safety. Either that shit or 60 days in jail. It's more and more clear to me how the system works. This isn't about justice at all. The cops are salesmen for the court system, the court system are in turn salesmen for the lawyers as well as the jails and prison system. I'm just caught up in their money making, creating slash keeping job scheme. The sentiment I'm getting is if I get a lawyer they'll do their little secret and shake wink wink, nudge nudge spear and boom most of that shit they want to offer me will disappear. All because some nammy pammy yuppie scumbag bicyclists can't take a joke and had to flag down a county sheriff. If I wanted to hurt that bastard crybaby excuse for a man in his little spandex outfit, I'd have walked right up to him and cunked him one good upside his faggoty ass self-improvement, body conscience head. I understand though I intimidated him in front of his little girlfriends and he had to regain his dignity somehow. When it rains it pours in Don Juan dead lawfare's upside down little world. Last week about Tuesday my cat disappeared, and I had no idea where. 
I looked all over the highway for his cute little orange furry corpse. I really hope that someone thought he was a stray and took him to a good home. Although they probably gave him a really cliche name like Garfield or Heathcliff. I'm going to miss him and his brother racing to my car to greet me every night when they hear the death metal blasting from my car as I turn the corner. He was the only cat I ever knew that had his own theme song. It went to the tune of the Flipper theme song. They call him Rimmer, Rimmer, faster than lightning, under your feet. They call him Rimmer, Rimmer, no one gets frightened quite often as he, well another perfectly original name I'd have to retire. If only Rhino wasn't allergic to cats I wouldn't have to lose all my furry friends to the highways and catnappers of the world. I'd have even more complaints, like, why in the hell is it that every place I work has this 180 degree toilet paper in all the bathrooms? Seriously, my asshole is tore the fuck up. I'm sick to death of wiping my ass until there is more blood than shit just to make sure I've done an efficient job. Why even bother with paper goods at all? Why not just hang a cheese grater on the wall and after I'm done shitting I can just scrape my ass bloody on that? Cheaper, yes, but considerably less sanitary I'm sure. Is it possible that they know I'm sitting there chuckling to myself that they are paying me twelve and a quarter to take a leisurely shit? They do it on purpose so people make an effort to do it at home. Just wait till we all start calling in sick because our asses are so bloody and raw that we can hardly walk. Then again they have us there because no one would have the guts to leave that on their supervisor's voicemail. This is tearing the ass out of me I want something done. Maybe I should consider hiring an attorney for that one as well. It's getting harder and harder all the time to suppress my sexual desires at work. There is just way too much choice pontang here in this building. My tongue is working overtime just to stay in my mouth. Really not so much of a bad thing, it's just that I can't even make a pass at any of it. First of all I'm a gutless excuse for a male, who freezes up around pretty girls. Like, say I get into an elevator with one or more of them. I start sweating, I don't know what to do with my hands. My face turns red and I just feel like a fucking tool in general. Besides that, if I even said something remotely that sounded like a come on I'd probably be slapped with sexual harassment so fast. So, how about them weathers? Then, wham I'm fucked. Not half as bad if they could read my mind though. Me fingering two of them at once while I'm eating another's pussy and another one sucking me off. Yeah, I'm so glad mind reading is fictional. I'd be in debt up to my ears with attorney fees. Okay for example there this one here, she sits in a cubicle at an end of a row. She is pole smoking hot. By that I mean the only way she could get any hotter is if she had all six inches of my pole down her throat and I was pumping my nuts deep into her guts. She always dresses so ladylike and all sexy. Then she teases me so, taking her shoes off and rubbing her feet together under her chair. It makes me just want to crawl up behind her and start nodding on those ankles like they were chicken drumsticks. She and I said hi and smiled to each other once or twice, but that's about the extent of it. Fuck fucking fucking around with all that regular social graces shit though. I just want to bend her over one of the copiers and tear her pussy up while another one is going to town on my scabby asshole. Then again that might violate someone's delicate sensibilities, and I wouldn't want to be responsible for that, I'd end up needing full-time legal representation, my kind of town. My kind of gown to wear to bed. Weird how these entries come about, I had a couple of muses for this one. First, last night a friend told me to tell her something that I'd never told anyone before, I don't remember what I said then, but this one coming is much better. Then today I was writing an email and Elvira Mistress of the Dark came up which reminded me of something I'd never told anyone ever. My mom is all big into Halloween, right? So she's also a beer drinker and one year she came home from the liquor store with one of those life-size cardboard advertisements of Elvira for Colors Light OK. She used it as a Halloween decoration for a couple years. The rest of the time it stood in our basement collecting dust. 
Well, before I moved out and before we had the internet or satellite, I'd be stuck jerking off to Fredericks of Hollywood or Vicky's secret catalogs. When those were all cooked up or I was sick of them, I'd get a bug up my ass and go down to the basement and flog the weasel standing in front of Elvira's cardboard cutout. I'd be all like standing there with my tongue hanging out staring at those big tits under that black dress and those long sexy legs. Then at times the dog would follow me down there and stand there looking at me like it was wondering what I was doing. I'd get all self-conscious about it and try and shut her away with my foot. Like leave me alone, fuck her on in cheese. I remember doing this a few times with good old Elvira in the basement. I think mostly I'd use the Hanover fist method to stop from spraying my gismol on the cardboard to avoid giving my little secret away. I just kind of let it drip on the dusty cement floor. If you're not familiar with the aforementioned Hanover fist method I'd be happy to elaborate, but it's pretty self-explanatory. It was either that or I'd just grab a Kleenex. Nothing beats letting your fuck fly though, just coating the hell out of anything and everything. I really hate pegging my semen, it's a waste and you have less of an intense orgasm. My feelings on that are blatantly obvious if you come into my bedroom and see the cum sequels that I dried to my webcam and the crusty stains on my wall there, thankfully it's that fake wood paneling so it's not too visible. I do mop it up every once in a while though. Okay wow that was a little more info than I wanted to share. Oh the memories though everlasting putrefied embrace. Each night sometime past dusk she visits my mausoleum. The stone slab covering my sarcophagus always replaced like it has been undisturbed. I watch from beyond each night longing to welcome her into my eternal resting place, but I am unable. She speaks softly into my ear telling me all the day's trials and tribulations. I want so much to have the motor control to stroke her hair and tell her everything is alright like I once did when I was alive to the rest of the world. She begins to caress my now festered face that once seemed like it was chiseled from stone. She leans over and opens my mouth and kisses me as stagnant effluvia emanates out into her mouth. She has become accustomed to the stench, which once made her expel the night's supper onto the floor of my tomb. I long to tell her how beautiful she still is, and run my fingers through her long black locks of hair that glimmer in the candlelight. To kiss the nape of her neck and caress every inch of her exposed pale flesh. She props me up as if to let me watch as she slowly and seductively undresses, the candlelight flickering her glorious form against the walls of my tomb. I have been unclad since the very first night. So she has no time to waste before her warm vigorous flesh is pressed against my frigid leathery skin. I recall how I would delight at such moments and how shivers would run up and down my spine. Those moments should have lasted forever. Now she sits in front of me, and takes my lifeless almost blue hand. She runs it up and down slowly against her warm quivering thighs. Her eyes close as she runs her fingers through my hair that is whitening after the years, it snags and pulls out here and there even with the gentleness she uses with my fragile form. Now she takes two fingers of my hand and caresses her outer labia and clitoris as she grinds into them. Now the moisture from her quim starts to cover my pallid fingers and she inserts two or three while stimulating alternately her ungorged clit and nipples. She makes no effort to muffle her sighs and moans except by kissing my cold blue lips. I long to kiss back, but my muscles are rigid and unresponsive, almost as if in a dream where you can't fight or run. The more excited she becomes, the more her cheeks flush red with passion, she seizes my decrepit prick in her hand, now stiff from decay she mounts me and inserts it as deep as she can and grinds her hips in a circular motion clenching her vaginal muscles at the point before the head would escape from her warm oozing cunt. How I long to grab those hips that define what the fairer sex should be and grind them harder and harder into mine she screams my name at the top of her lungs, for she has no shame for the necrophile passions she has for me, bites her lips, grinds, into my gangrenous hips and finally reaches her denouement. Her violent vaginal neuromuscular contractions nearly rip my now useless cock from my frail lifeless body. 
Afterwards she spends a few blissful minutes gloating over her dead lover before she places me back in my resting place and kisses me goodbye and leaves again until tomorrow night hark. Pucary old Nina stings, glory to the newborn king. A couple months ago for a lunch I went to check out this place near my work called the Macaroni Grill. From the name I thought it would be some place that specialized in weird macaroni and cheese concoctions so I went in to check it out. It turned out to be some fancy schmanky Italian restaurant. Well I said what the fuck and ate there anyway. A nondescript hostess sat me at a table, which was over near the bar, one of those high-rise tables with stools for seats the ones with backrests. The first thing I noticed was that there was a large plain white piece of paper for a tablecloth and crayons on the table. A plain looking waitress came and grabbed a violet crayon and said, Hi I'll be your server Heather, as she wrote her name on the paper tablecloth. Okay I thought and ordered a drink. After she came back with it I decided to try their $15 dollar half serving of beef lasagna. For that price it had better be damn good I had thought. Then she brought out some homemade bread for an appetizer and took this weird olive oil shit with spices in it and dumped it on a small plate and said it was to dip the bread into. The smell of the bread was awesome and I tried the oil shit with it and nearly heaved. The food came quickly and it looked and smelled good. After tasting it I decided it wasn't worth the price and also decided never to go back. Well I ate the shit and when she brought the bill I gave her my MasterCard. As she was away I had a fun idea, I left her my favorite little poem on the paper tablecloth in blue crayon. Some of you may remember this. There once was a man named James who kept a dead whore in a cage he's a bit of a shit you'll have to admit but think of the money he saved. Ha ha only kidding, I figured she'd read it and laugh after she moved the plate and her tip off of it. I'd never see her again and always chuckle about it. Then the next day at lunch I went to the greasy arches which is also near my work. I hardly ever have cash so I went in my wallet for the MasterCard check card again. It was missing, I was a bit scared that I'd left it in my ATM machine again. I was sure I hadn't. I ended up paying with my American Express that I had for emergencies. Over lunch I brainstormed for the last place I'd used it. Gas? Mumber groceries? No. Where the fuck did I eat lunch the day before? Then it occurred to me, the macaroni grill. Oh shit. Yes. I got out of there so fast before she could see my poem that I'd forgot to grab my card out of the black book thing. So I went back there on my walk back to work expecting to be treated weird. I asked the hostess, who said they found one and she took my name and went in the back. I didn't see my waitress from the day before. Two other waitresses came up to me and asked if I needed help before the manager came out with a great big smile and my card. Nothing was said about my visit the day before. I was somewhat relieved, but wondered if she showed anyone else or not. I haven't been back since. Look at that butt, look at him gorge away. All the boys playing with his butt. Yesterday was the final pre-trial in my case involving the bicyclist harassment ordeal. I met my mom in the afternoon and she gave me a ride up to the courthouse. The last I'd heard from my lawyer was that he was all fired up, but no word on what he was going to get out of the district attorney who was prosecuting me. I was nervous and expecting probation or a few weeks in jail. Their original plea bargain had me pleading to endangering safety and getting sentenced to two years probation, alcohol and other drug classes. 100 hours of community service, apology letters to the victims, as well as court costs. We arrived a few minutes before my lawyer and once he got there he talked quickly with the DA, who apparently is a shrewd bitch. She had long red hair the first time I'd seen her and yesterday it was cut short and dyed blonde. She used to look hot, but now she just looks like a cunt. Anyhow, the lawyer calls me into the legal resource room and sat me down. He said and I quote, I really pulled a rabbit out of my ass somehow. We must have caught her on a good day. He got her to agree to let me plead to the lesser charge disorderly conduct with a weapon. He also talked her down to a year probation, which she is notorious for giving at least 18 months in weapons offenses. The extra list of other shit like the letters, classes, community service, 
would all remain the same and she wouldn't budge. It was still a lot, but I wasn't expecting any miracles. Somehow my case was one of the very last that they called. I kept looking at the clock and thinking about the $150 and hour I was selling out for my lawyer. Finally they called us up there, another assistant DA than the bitch blonde one sat in for the prosecution. I made my plea and the judge looked over the sentence and squinted and looked dumbfounded. I was a bit scared he would throw the book at me. When he read the 100 hours of community service he stopped and questioned the DA if I had a prior record. The DA answered, not much of one your honor. The judge said he wasn't condoning my behavior but he thought that they were asking too much. He then asked if the victims were contacted, and they had been, but were not seeking anything. Then he asked about my jail credit which was five days, and I can't figure out how I got an extra day since it was actually for good behavior. Anyway he asked me if I did stupid things when I drink, I answered honestly, yes. Then he said that he found me guilty and that instead of the plea bargain he was sentencing me to four days in jail and court costs of $73. Essentially, time served I was free to go even the court costs got ate up by the extra day in jail. He also made sure to tell me he didn't want to see me again. The motherfucking DA got treated. It all happened so fast that I really didn't understand it. My lawyer was confused too. He said he'd never seen the judge do that ever before. He was still under the impression that I'd have the probation and all the other shit. Which really confused me because I took it as I was free. We went down to the clerk and handed her the paper and she was like, Alright I don't need anything else from you. My lawyer stopped her and said I had probation. She said that it had been crossed out. Then he finally got it I think. My mom had mentioned something about the judge seeming to recognize her. Then she said when he read my name it looked like something clicked. When she heard his name again she thought he used to work out at my grandfather's gym. So he made that knew our family. That may have been part of it along with the DA's bogus offer. My grandfather is quite a well liked man. I am still fucking stunned and so happy. I couldn't act brave that it turned out any better. Never before had I walked away from a court appearance smiling. Justice was served in my eyes, four days jail is even a little harsh, but it's already over. I hope that DA thinks twice next time she tries to fuck with someone so hard for something so trivial. When all is said and done, I took a lot away from this thing. I realized that alcohol is what causes me to get in trouble and I recognize that my binge drinking needs to be under wraps. Even though most times I am a fun drunk, every once in a while I end up doing something I need to apologize for. It reminds me too much of how my mother was. When I was young she'd verbally abuse us kids and end up apologizing the next day when she was sober. Then eventually the apology stopped, but her behavior got worse. That isn't how I want to see myself. I always tried to learn from her mistakes. It's been nearly three weeks since I've drunk and I really am not missing anything. I've had my share of drunk and fun, I'm even a party legend in my own right. I just need to make sure I am the one in control and not my precious booze. My grandma and your grandma sitting by a tire my grandma said to your grandma, I'm gonna set your tampon string on fire. While I'm amazed at how many people take time to tell me how much they enjoy my stories, then they beg for me to tell them more. James tell me a story, entertain me, you're so funny da da da. Then they get all grossed out when I tell them about my two month old bath towel slash cooking rag that is crusty as hell. How I stub my tongue on it if I leave it on the floor. Speaking of which I'm going to make a porno starring myself, Fatty Bagwell, as the mob father. Holy shit it was such a shame Saturday when I sprayed the biggest most amazing load on that towel, that one was meant to cover a woman's body. HMM I digress badly. Okay, here's one from the annals way back 10 years ago or so when I was 18. My friends cat met and I came upon this house party on the east side of Madison somehow. Anyway we both knew people at the thing. There were even some of my best friends from grammar school that I'd lost touch with there. I was drinking and having a really good time. 
Then this girl I'd known from my freshman year in high school showed up. Way back when she was all hot after me and trying to get me to cheat on my girlfriend with her. I never did even know months after my girlfriend at the time sucked off my best friend, which is a whole other story. Anyway this broad whose name was Watts her tits showed up and was all over me. I was sure that I was going to be banging that shit that night. So my friend Matt wanted to go, but Watts her tits had her own car and I was planning on leaving with her. So I told him just to take off that I had a ride. No sooner than I had left the porch where my pontang had been to mix a drink and came back did I find something disturbing. Some other guys had showed up at the party and one of them was in my seat on the couch next to Watts her tits. Except Watts her tits was on this guy's lap grinding into him and making out with him. I was quite shocked. That wasn't like the Watts her tits I'd known in years previous. This bitch was being scandalous and nasty. I felt insulted and dejected so I started pounding the drinks more. I remember her addressing me about the issue, introducing me to the guy as some friend of hers and making some sort of lame excuse like he was leaving the state soon. Knowing what I know now I should have known that since she was the only bitch at the party she'd get fought over and pass eight around. But at this point in my life I was still a virgin and in high school living at my grandmother's for the summer to work. If I'd been smart I'd have taken her inside and fucked her in some room, got a nut and let someone else have the slot. Sometime later in the night I was talking to the old school buddies and I ran out of cigarettes. I asked them if there was a place open I could buy more. They gave me directions to a place up the street that was open 24 hours and I set out up the street alone to go buy some. I went alone to kind of sulk about being fucked over by that bitch like a pussy. I made a mental note of the house address in case I couldn't find it on my way back. It was a nice summer night and I slowly walked up the street enjoying the quiet of the city streets at night. I made it to the store easily and dot my smokes. I turned back down the street to make my way back. I got about a half block before I noticed a shabbily dressed black fellow in his mid-twenties coming at me from the other direction. As we passed eight I gave him a friendly nod of acknowledgement and tried to continue on. He stopped me though, for what I figured was to ask for a cigarette or some spare change. That wasn't it at all though. He said to me, can I suck your dick? I was sure I misheard him and asked, oh, to which he said the same thing, can I suck your dick? I was shocked and immediately said, no man I'm not into that type of thing, and he retorted with, no one would have to know. Then I countered with, I know. And then I continued walking. The whole thing made me uncomfortable and nervous. Then to hear his footsteps coming behind me the other way he was initially walking struck me with panic. I looked back as I paced myself faster. Then once I saw his face again I broke out into a full sprint. Slowing in front of a house that looked familiar to check the number. It wasn't and I figured I'd run too far and I was scared to check behind me so I decided I'd run down a side street. I took the next one and went down a hill towards some apartment buildings. I ran around one of them and spotted a light on behind a glass sliding door. I went up to it seeing a fellow sleeping on a couch. I pounded and pounded on the glass. He wouldn't budge. I decided I was going to keep knocking until the fucker snapped out of it. I must have pounded for five minutes. Then a figure appeared out of a dark hallway and came up to the door. I was relieved, but still a bit scared I'd just walked into the arms of another sexual deviant. I plead my case and apologized for waking him. Saying that someone was trying to rape me and that I just needed to use the phone. He looked like he felt sorry for me and said something about the neighborhood going to hell then showed me to his phone. I called Matt who was supposed to be my original ride. I told him what had happened. He laughed at me and asked if I'd learned my lesson about women. Matt being asexual was warning me in the first place just to let him give me a ride home instead of gambling on lots hurt hits. I was willing to chance it anyway, and at least I came away with some kind of experience. Scat Matt came and got me. I waited talking to my new friend and drinking a beer that he offered me until he got there. It turned out that I'd not even got to the block I was supposed to get back to the house at. 
When we drove by again Lots her tits car was gone and all looked like it had died down. At Lots her tits bitch came back to dick tease me several more times. Once I even left my own 23rd birthday party to take her and fuck her. Then when she got into my bed she said, I don't have sex with guys unless I get a date first. Then she rolled over and fell asleep. That was about the last time she looked decent enough to fuck. Fucking cunt, she knew if I hung my bone in her but once she'd be following me around like a lovesick puppy. Talking about hey now. Didn't I see you in the donkey show through my glory hole? I often wonder to myself if I hate women, or if I am just projecting my own self-loathing onto them. Or maybe, am I just not meeting the right ones? Most girls I meet besides a handful don't seem to have much personality and I've gotten road rash from gravel that seems more intelligent at times. Maybe women are standoffish towards me because I am more of an individual than they are used to. It makes a person feel bitter when they are judged before they have a chance to show their true colors as a human being. Sometimes it's easier to look at a woman as a piece of meat instead of a person. More humorous as well. I always laugh to myself when I am driving and see a hot broad in the car at a light next to me and I say aloud, Hey, slut. Or if I see a tubby bitch walking in front of me in a parking lot. In that case I say, Hey. Fat slut, or, let's see your tits fatty. Of course they don't hear it, and I would never talk to a woman like that. In fact I have a lot of respect for women generally, but oftentimes that respect isn't reciprocated. I can name a dozen times when I've been let down or had my heart broken by some wench. I guess my ritual of saying that type of stuff is a healthy way of dealing with all the ass pains women have given me. Being a nice guy has never paid off for me, even though by nature I am a nice guy. So in reaction I've learned to be asshole-ish and cocky whenever appropriate. Just to let them know where I stand. I'm not a welcome mat, they have to earn their respect, as they have to earn mine. Mildly and related, in April I went to Watts Her Tits and her twin sister's birthday party at Watts Her Tits house. Watts her tits and her sister Watts her other tits are Sasquatch La Rong, my ex-roommate's cousins. Watts her tits is the short chubby one with a decent face. Watts her other tits is a bit taller and quite decent looking all around. Needless to say they are not identical twins. Watts her tits has had a major thing for me for a while, despite the fact she has a lame ass Texan boyfriend who I refer to as the death mute and at a party last year her and I had a drunken fling and I'd promised myself not to fall into that horrid crevice again. Anyway, they had a half barrel of Berg off dark and I was trying to stay until it was finished, but they didn't have enough of a turnout to come even close to finishing it. The next thing I know is that I'm standing in their garage all alone with a beer, because everyone had left without me knowing it. Needless to say I was quite shit-faced. Watts her tits walks in and we start to talk and then she comes on to me, kissing me and groping at my cock. As you may be aware when a woman starts groping a drunken single man's cock through his pants he's probably gonna wanna fuck no matter how but ugly or fat the groper island okay with much exception, but you get my drift, keep in mind through all this that lots her. Tits's death mute was somewhere inside their house. It may have been that knowing this fact made the situation more exciting to me and instigated what followed. We went inside her house to the basement, the door being right inside the garage entrance to their kitchen. We made out on their couch in the basement for a good 15 more minutes I'd say. At that point my erection was in a throbbing rage and I kept telling her to the best of my memory, I want my cock inside you bitch. She kept asking why I was calling her bitch, and I told her she liked it and to shut up. I slightly remember her taking off her clothes and I got down and licked her pussy. It had been some time since I'd done this, eating snatch was something I'd always enjoyed. I guess I'd enjoyed it more when I had a hot girl with a nice body to look up at and hear moms from. So that didn't last long. I reiterated that I wanted to feel her pussy around my meat and clumsily put on a rubber in my drunken fashion. Probably hoping I'd fuck her hard enough that her twin sister would feel it. I start to fucking. She starts with the, oh fuck me Don Juan, fuck me. Fuck me harder. 
Stop. This is something that bothers the piss out of me. Fuck you. Fuck you. What does it feel like I'm doing taking your pulse? Vaginally? Harder? I'm pounding it into you as fucking hard as I can. Yet, you're just going to lie there like a frozen corpse? Fuck. At least try and throw in a grind once in a while. Use them hips, will ya? I know it must be a lot of work moving that fat ass, but please. All this going on in my head and finally a moment of clarity. I'm drunk as a priest on Sunday and she's loose as an altar boy after mass. I can't feel a damn thing with this condom so I'd be at this until sunrise. She really wasn't that loose I just like that line about the altar boy, what the fuck am I doing? I said aloud and pulled out, taking off the condom. I hiked up my shorts and went upstairs only to be met by the deaf mute. He said I looked too drunk to drive home and went and got me a blanket and let me sleep on their couch. Yet he didn't seem suspicious of me. I played it cool as the thonge. I awoke startled the next morning and my foot kicked a full cup of beer off their end table onto the carpet. Not my beer. I always finish my beers. It was Easter Sunday around 7 a meters and I promised my mom I'd come over for the stinking hootla. No one else seemed to be stirring. So I cleaned up what I could of the spilt beer and quietly let myself out. I had a head-splitting hangover and vaguely recalled what had happened. I sort of thought it was a dream until on the way out, reaching for the keys to my green Moby asked in my pocket I pulled out a used but you and could me condom. Then realizing I'd carelessly thrown the wrapper on the floor of their basement. To top it all off when I got to my rib some pig fucking ass white had had it. I wondered death mute. But thought not, later to find out lots her other tits car had been egged before she left at 3 a meters as well. Last week I was over at Sasquatch La Rongs I was talking to Monistat thinking no one else knew what happened that night and she told me a riotously funny fact. That morning after I left, the deaf mute found lots her tits asleep naked in their basement. He told her that he didn't want it ever brought up. Ha ha, what a Texan pussy. Thankfully they recently moved to Texas so I never have to worry about her unwanted advances on my poor helpless drunken ass. And just to set the record straight, if a girl I was having sex with was good looking enough I could care less what they say during sex. Hell, say the ABCs if it pleases you, but if you're pushing fondly you better make up for it with some damn expert fucking. She asked what I'd like for breakfast and I told her air biscuits and gravy. I had second thoughts about writing this story. It's kind of a weird situation. I'll start out with the background. First of all I've never been a peeping Tom. However being a man entails being a voyeur at heart. Men are turned on by visual stimulation and most women are emotionally and physically stimulated. Quite a while ago a close friend and I were discussing how nice it would be to walk by an unshattered window and catch a beautiful woman undressing or even better yet, going to work on herself with a giant double dogger and just spanking it right there on the spot, and spilling our man juices all over her petunias. That's how we both found Jesus one night in March or April this year. It was a Wednesday night after bar time. We'd both been quite hammered and we jumped in his car for what I'd expected to be a ride home. All of a sudden he pulls into a parking lot in an apartment complex only a few blocks from the last bar we'd been to. It was a gorgeous night and all the stars were out to accompany a full moon. I'd figured a close friend was stopping to visit someone, but I found out his intention was for us to split up and go find an open window with some action in it. Despite being a good way to get locked up and get the type of sexual predator, it seemed pretty exciting and the faults didn't really occur in our drunken minds. We each went around a separate building and ended up meeting behind a third with no luck. We walked together about two thirds past this building and spotted a lit up apartment on the second floor. My close friend spotted two people. One looked to be about in his twenties sitting in a chair and the other was an older woman in about her mid-forties standing in front of the young man in the chair. She's about to give him head, my close friend proclaimed excitedly. All of a sudden the woman breaks for her balcony and opens the door and steps out. My close friend immediately ran and dived behind a bush. My fight or flight instincts must have been impaired and I immediately dropped to the ground and lied still. 
my bit of my sweatshirt still covering my head while I lay in the light from her window. My heart was pounding and I was sure I was fucked and if she saw me I'd have to make a quick decision. She didn't seem to see me and called to her young companion to come see the moon. As soon as he came out I heard, who is that? And he called out to me using someone else's name. I decided if I got up and ran they'd think I was a robber or a pervert and call the cops. So I acted like I was passed out. He kept telling the woman that it looked like his friend so and so and she told him to try and wait me while she stayed there. By this time I'd came up with my story. He shook me a couple times and I played my best part at acting like I was waking up from a blackout. He asked who I was and why I was there. I told him that my friend and I had gotten in a fight with a bouncer who'd called the cops on us and we were running from the cops together after parking in their complex and the last thing I remembered was tripping over a rock. Just then my close friend walked up out from behind the bush acting happy he found me. He heard my little farce and immediately started adding in missing details. The couple introduced themselves and told us they were mother and son. They invited us in their house until the heat from the fuzz died down. My close friend and I both graciously accepted. We walked in and the walls were covered in Jesus shit and they were listening to gospel music at a high volume. They offered us a seat and something to drink as a beautiful Alaskan Malamute with one brown eye and one blue eye sniffed at me. I pet him and the woman observed how good I was with her dog. I confessed my love for all animals while the dog started massaging my shoulder with his teeth in a loving friendly sort of way. It was actually one of the most relaxing feelings after what I'd just been through. For some reason my close friend and I both opened up to these people right away. We all went on their balcony to smoke and the mother volunteered the information that her son had been doing coke for the last two days straight. I asked him if he'd be willing to share. He said he'd had a teener left from a half ounce he'd bought with his tax returns and agreed. He cut up the lines and asked his mother if she'd like one. She said that maybe just this once she'd take one. It was funny because later the kid said that he'd never done any drugs with her before since she used to be an addict years ago before she accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and personal Savior. This kid's coke was pretty damn good. It immediately made me a motor mouth. We all sat there talking a million miles a minute about religion and it actually turned out to be one of the most meaningful philosophical conversations I'd ever had. The lady kept inviting us to her church with both of them. My close friend asked if it'd be a good place to meet nice women. Her son answered for her by saying there were a lot of hotties there. We told her we'd think about it then. The kid offered us another line for free and we took it. I ended up buying another for my close friend and I later for five bucks. By this time it was nearly 5 a.m. and my close friend still had to work the next day at 7. There was no way either of us was sleeping now. Before we left we gave them our phone numbers and told them our intention to come to church with them sometime they gave us some Jesus pamphlets to read in the meantime. As soon as we got to my close friend's car we both broke out in hysterical laughter. Agreeing that was the weirdest possible way to find Jesus. Faintly though we both thought it some odd type of blessing that it worked out the way it did. Better than ending up in the clink anyway. Needless to say we both also agreed never to go peeping in any windows ever again. Anyone know the Heimlich maneuver? I think I had a massive shard attack. I'm constantly told to let the past go. Yet I constantly tell old stories in here. More to learn from the past than to drudge up bad old memories. I'm the type of person who doesn't hold a grudge and forgives easily. So yeah, this is going to be one of those childhood memories entries. As a child I was very well behaved, soft spoken, and polite. Most of that was due to the fact I was conscious that my birth was somewhat of a burden on my mom's life. She told me numerous times as a child that I should be grateful that she had me as her aunts and sisters tried to talk her into having an abortion with me. She also told me that my father raped her, meaning statutory rape, but as a child I knew no difference. Anyway I did my best to behave and not be a burden on her or the family who took care of me while she was at school, or out drinking and dating on the weekends. I also was very observant as a child, 
I listened to and understood the adults' conversations, a lot of which were my relatives backstabbing my mother right in front of me. Growing up without a father in my life made me somewhat of a mama's boy. She was the one person who never left me so I was always jealous when she'd bring a new boyfriend into the picture. I was shy around adult males, mostly her boyfriends, and my friend's father too. I also never had a good example of what a healthy male-female relationship was like. My mom and her boyfriends couldn't teach me that. I think only seeing her interact with my real father would have been an example that would have made an impact. My mom would often tell me that men are assholes Jimmy, except for you dot. Which also made me want to grow up and fulfill that expectation. Little did I know that that is not how the world works, women are attracted to assholes. My mom always found the worst. Between my kindergarten and first grade we moved in with one of her boyfriends named Kevin during the summer. Kevin owned his own bar with a flat that was above it where we lived. This was in the boonies so there wasn't much for me and my three-year-old sister to do. Some nights if it was slow they'd have her and I down to the bar to visit. This old man named Denny liked me a lot. He was a big fat grandpa type that looked like Santa Claus. He gave me a plastic alligator that I kept till I was about 15. Anyway Kevin, my mom's old man was abusive to her. I remember one time my sister coming upstairs crying, Mommy needs a band-aid. Kevin had given her a fat bloody lip and a black eye. That sort of thing tore me up as a kid. She was the only one who had been constant in my life, and her asshole boyfriend was a threat to that. After that happened he bought me an expensive remote control car to make me like him. I broke it the first day and he said he was getting it fixed and never did. During that time when my mom and Kevin would go out on the weekends Kevin's teenaged nephew would watch my sister and I I remember saying some kind of swear word while playing Candyland and this kid took me into a bedroom, dropped my pants and took a hunting arrow to my bare ass. That was really awkward and didn't feel right, as I was well aware at five about child molestation. I told my mom about it and she thought I was lying. Then next time he said us the same happened to my sister, who also told. My mom believed her as there were still welts and that weird fucker never watched us again. You can't really expect a three and a five year old to talk like they are in some gay school when they live above a bar. We didn't make that entire summer living there, as my mom ended up running from that guy. Fifteen years later I found out Kevin had sold the bar and came out of the closet as being gay. That was pretty funny to hear. Some of the happiest times I remember were when my mom, sister, and I lived alone in the Blue Mountains trailer park with our collie and a sheltie. These times were good because mom had given a break from dating. It was just us three there and no boyfriend bossing us around or causing misery. That didn't last long though as my mom met my sister John's father there who lived in a trailer kitty corner across the street from us. He was a cop in that nothing town. Tall six single quote five, well built, a shock of red hair, he really intimidated me. Almost off the bat my mom tells us we're moving in with him, his idea of course. We found out soon how controlling he was. It was his rules, or else, and he had a mean streak as wide as he was tall. My mom wasn't allowed to work and supper was expected to be on the table. He had something against me as I wouldn't call him daddy like my sister Jenny did. For that she also got away with murder. He made Jenny and I take showers together to save on hot water. Once Jenny's friend came over while we were showering together, my mom told her that we were in the shower so she came in and peeked behind the curtain. I didn't realize this until I heard a squeaky little, it looks like a little soldier, come out of nowhere. She was referring to my penis. There was also an occasion I went to the park without asking. When I came back Patrick, the boyfriend, sentenced me to a week's grounding. His grounding meant you were in your room and you didn't come out unless it was the bathroom. He also didn't allow you to eat. I remember my mom sneaking me Oreo cookies and milk during that. When it got really bad he would be drinking. The worst it was is when he came home drunk, threw dishes around the kitchen cause his dinner wasn't out. Then he proceeded to threaten my mom that if she thought about leaving that he'd kill her. 
Then he went and got my newborn sister Jama out of her crib and held his .38 special to her head saying, I gave her a life, I can take it away. A week later during school my sister and I were called to the office where my mom and one of her girlfriends were waiting with little Jana. She told us that we were moving and all of our stuff was packed outside. We left directly from the office and never even had a chance to say goodbye to our friends. Patrick never followed us. Several years later on Jana's birthday my mom had Jenny call him and tell him it was his daughter's birthday. His response was, I don't care. I don't want anything to do with her. Then after a few more moves we moved into an apartment complex. I was in fourth maybe fifth grade. I was into poison and the bag my long hair was more of a mullet. There was a teenage kid with a hot rod car that would stop in front of our house and do burnouts a lot. He was 17 and his name was Jamie Culver, a big kid who looked older. He had long curly brown hair and he was an avid Cinderella fanatic. The reason he was doing the burnouts was because he had a major crush on my mom. She resisted him or at least she claimed to, but he would still come over and buddy up to me in order to get close to her. My friends and I could wrestle with him and beat on him as much as we wanted. He'd do anything I asked of him. One time he built me a six foot quarter pipe skateboard ramp. So one weekend evening I was having my two best friends over for the night. Jamie and my mom were in her room together, she had a large walk-in closet at my baby sister's crib as well as extra blankets were housed. I walked in at night not thinking to get blankets for my guests. Jamie and her were under the covers together, he being on top and hurriedly jumped off when I walked in. She told me, Jamie was just giving me a back rub, not thinking I was smart enough to know what was going on. Eventually they thought about him racing a 84 Firebird, I ratted him out, and he was nothing more than a memory. A couple years ago my mom, sister Jenny and I were reminiscing about old times and I brought up that memory of the back rub night. They both laughed about it for like five minutes, she admitted that more than that had happened. A year later we moved again, this time to rent controlled housing in one of Madison's ghettoish neighborhoods, a wide drive. I'll never forget my friends and I shouting obscenities at the 50 or so Cambodian kids across the street. These kids ran around in nothing but diapers all year round and didn't have to go to school for some reason. I had never been much of a fighter, to this day I've only been in two fights. One day while I lived in this neighborhood I was riding the bus home from school sitting with a friend in a seat near the back. I was cracking jokes to my buddy and told him, your grandma soul she farts dust. Well one of the black kids behind us heard that and tapped me on the shoulder, what'd you say about my grandmoms? I explained that I wasn't talking to him, yet he persisted with it and told me that once we got off the bus he was going to beat me up. I was a bit scared, my buddy said he'd protect me when we got off and when we did he did the opposite and jetted home as soon as we hit pavement. So I was left to defend myself. So this kid starts talking trash to me and pushed me then ran. I started swinging my arms wildly and chasing after him. He ran off into the bad part of the neighborhood. Then the next day on the bus ride home he told me again he was going to kick my ass. I wasn't too worried until I got off the bus and he plumped me out to a group of his older cousins who were standing there passing a joint around. This that little one he was telling us about? They asked. They circled around me. I was about pissing myself and just out the corner of my eye I saw my mom checking the mail at the mailbox across from the bus stop, probably for a child support or welfare check. I plumped her out to them and said, That's my mom right there you better leave me alone. They didn't believe me. I called out to her several times. She never heard and walked back to our apartment building. I don't remember how I got away from them. They just scared me and I think I slipped out between them and ran home. I never rode the bus to that school again after that. That was about the time my mom met her current boyfriend and the father of my younger brother. I had made my mom promise that year that she wouldn't have a boyfriend on my birthday for once. That promise never came true. Her new boyfriend was pretty nice. I was used to them kissing my ass by then though so I thought it was a fluke. 
He even took me to a poison concert and then I think I forgave her for breaking that promise. We eventually moved more and lived separate from him until I was about 15. I started on drugs and got in a BMX accident riding with friends. He put his foot down made me cut my hair to shoulder length and moved us all out to his house in the boonies where I lived with them until I was 19. They are still together to this day. They sleep in different beds and my mom's alcoholism has gotten worse so they are constantly at each other's throats. Now it wasn't the worst of childhoods. I was provided for the best she could, never physically beaten to bad, or molested. Still I think a child should be entitled to a bit more than that. Had things been any different I think I'd be a different man today than I am. I have a lot of things I want to tell my father. One time he flew me to Texas to visit him, he took me to buy shoes. I picked out blue suede airlocks with lace savers. He asked me then why I couldn't like Nikes or Reeboks like a normal kid. I'd like to remind him of that, and tell him that that is partially his own fault that I wasn't a normal kid. Also I think the reason I've only had one meaningful relationship is because I lacked that experience of them ever interacting together. I never saw them even talk once face to face. Once when I was six they hooked up for a date and a one night stand. I didn't even see him till the next morning when I went to take a piss before watching Saturday morning cartoons. He was in the shower and told me to come in. Just as I finished he threw open the shower curtain, rubbed my head and said, Hey sport, I don't remember saying anything back, but noticing that he had an amazingly big pecker. Even without a dad, just even a normal relationship to use as an example. I had examples of bad ones, but no good. Being kind, fun, honest, passionate, and caring seems like it would be enough. But there must be something I am missing. To this day my mom still tells me that her life would have been a lot better if she didn't have to make all the sacrifices that she made to keep and raise us. I know how she must feel. I've put myself in her shoes many times. Which is one virtue I possess that she doesn't. As a whole my life has taught me that you should think of the consequences of your actions and words before you act on them or say things that can't be taken back. Especially with children, I think they are smarter than we give them credit for. I busted a gut when I nut in the butt of some slot. I met on the back of the bus in Nantucket. Man would she suck it as long as you threw a nickel in the bucket. Hell she'd take a dutch it. The authorities warned her if she stayed on that corner she'd get knifed by some porn perv and no one would mourn her. She'd kneel on the ground and bob up and down just to go into town. Never a frown as she'd wolf that thing down. She'd stroke and caress it. Man it's the best shit, when her chin did your balls hit. Never a scrape with her mouth agape, the shaft skillfully passade. Her teeth as you laughed and wondered how long the nickel last as angry pedestrians passade. Went this away and that again. Doing their school shopping or drunk and late night bar hopping. Going home to their two kids or to watch their new porn vids. This rarely faced any as she wiggled her fanny and was all she can be just like the army. The last couple while she bust her freestyles which explained all the piles of nickels and dutchets which laid in her bucket as she gracefully sucked dick on that corner in Nantucket. Then all of a sudden you'd scream fuck it as your balls charged and reared like some big ornery steer then she'd put it in gear like a Honda Accord, a big rusty shady, or some hot rod red Ford. After each full mouthed swallow, a big gulping sound followed that echoed in the hollow. That wasn't all though cause little old Lenny would offer up her fanny, man what a dandy, she gave her permission to do as you'd been wishing all for the nickel free rain with your pickle and that's why I busted a gut as the rest of my nut drained. Deep in the butt of any, Miss Fanny, some slut who may have been a trunny that I'd met on the back of that bus in a suburb of western Nantucket. Oh, two Sharon Needles know she's not happy to see you. That's just a bent up spoon in her pocket. She's Sharon Needles, and if you get to close while she's stumbling around in that opiate induced fog, she just might involuntarily share a needle with you. Oh, don't worry, she was only at the clinic once this week, and that was just for the AIDS, not hips or anything. John Wayne licked cancer, so you think you can't lick AIDS? She was just at the greasy arches. They had one of those diabetic-friendly needle disposal bins there. 
She thinks it's a waste they only use them once. Usually she goes to the needle exchange, but they are closed on Sundays. It's like fucking cheers for her down there. Everyone knows her by name one way or another. She met her lesbian lover down there, in your knees. She's a big beautiful black woman who's into some sick, gas-powered, to throttling, jackhammer, strip on dildo shit. Sharon Needles gets right down on her knees for that, you bet. Inyanese had to replace Sharon's teeth three times already. Good thing she's got money, and drugs for Sharon Needles, all varieties of shit to shoot up. Shooting each other up gets them hot. They ran out of veins so they had to get creative. When the weeping black and sores on their arms are healing they'll take turns shooting each other in the tits, between the toes, fuck once in a while they throw a dude in the mix and shoot it in his cock hole. Sharon's Gordy from shooting up that last 40, by Gordy I mean gorded, or gorged if you will, on the boat. Engorged and lazy with the warm relaxing waves coming over her, the buzzes are amazing. That's at least what she's claiming. She'd be writing this herself. But she can't seem to keep her eyes open long enough to get a word out. Come to think of it she can't even write in the first place. She started hooking out of the seventh grade. Her first John was some guy named Dave. Boy were the knee pads fresh back then. Now the only thing she puts in her mouth is that bent up spoon. Holding it over the candle while tightening her tourniquet. Right that age train Sharon Needles. It's what you do best. She claims she ain't took a shit in a few days. When she does it's gonna rip her ass about 20 different ways. That shit binds you up Sharon, the state she's in now I doubt she's really caring. Crack, methadone, oxycontin, and smack. She's gonna mainline all four, sit back and apathetically relax, speedballing through the euphoric poppy fields, can't nothing bring her back. Wait, did she OD? No she's already jittery in the knees. She's already ready already. To shove the dove I mean. She's shared needles with the best of them, even that one black actor, Denzel Washing Machine. Yeah they rode the horse together, at the most trusty of steeds. Where you gonna stick that needle now Sharon? That Kaylee flooring ward on your ass looks like it may be connected to an artery. Hope that callus on top I to thick, it just may bend your needle. That one you got out of the bin at McDonald's is looking quite feeble. Here. Use mine, just fix me up when you're done. Shit are you holding out on us? I see how you are. I'll tell Anya about all your coat hanger babies hidden in them jars. I stood there and watched that botched one. I think it was mine, can't be quite sure though Sharon. I mean at first I thought I was in line for the men's room. Then all of a sudden boom, there you are with those big hairy tits hanging down taking a cock in each sloppy hole and a needle in each arm. Hell I had no hang UPS, I'd do anything once, even die. But I did lose track of my load that night, it got mixed in with all the rest though, dripping down your thaw, something like twelve other guys. You didn't tell me till after, for that I had to get you high. You said, I'm Sharon Needles babe, no one can deny. Come on over here, big boy and shoot me up in the corner of my eye. I said, damn bitch I'll let you use my plunger, or syringe, we can't share an evil though that's too out on the fringe, sanity I mean. She interrupted with the truth though, I must admit. She said, you dumb inbred motherfucker, now you give a shit. Ten minutes ago you were fucking me Billy Bear back same time as that big black dude, you know the one with the giant horse edict? She had me there, and although two wrongs don't make a right. I live for the moment and since I've been down that path with you I share needles every night. Hey hey hey, the day I got AIDS, right parenthesis love letter to Sharon Needles dear Sharon, I know you ain't caring, but I fell for ya, baby my heart I'm bearing. I should have known better when I sent that first love letter. You're in love with the junk, now I feel downtrodden like it's a big punk. It was all lies wasn't it? Just to get at my stash. You're so fucking low Sharon, letting me in your warm, wet, loose, gash. Then I flipped you over and pounded you in the ass. While I was in the act, my balls flopping against the edge of your crack. Your greasy little hand was in my pocket undoing my bindles, of all the low-down swindles. 
I almost got shot selling that one to this Mexican out front of Gingles. Well I hope you enjoyed that fix, as I cut that shit six times, bitch. You told me I meant more to you than that, and now I'm not amazed. You said it in the heat of the moment, foaming at the mouth, and drug crazed. You got it bad, don't you? One ounce of prevention would have saved you from the ten tons of intervention you now need. Seriously bitch you should take up smoking the weed. You can't cook that and shoot it though can you? I think that's what you're in love with. The live fast, die young thrills you get from chopping up, cooking, and shooting those pills. I'm sick and then fed up bitch, thinking of heading for the hills. But fuck I'm feeling too ill. I bet I got whatever you have. And it's not just the jonesing. It hurts when I pee Sharon, this shit ain't funny. The clinic won't take me back right now, I still owe them money. That spot you shot me in the penis is sure turning green. I think the infection is moving towards my spleen. So don't bother waiting by the mailbox, as this just may be my last love letter. Since I found out you gave me the AIDS, I've never felt better. Now needles aren't the only things we share. I can't keep much food down and I wish you were here to hold my hair. As I started out here I doubt that you really care. So open your eyes you cold heart bitch, and feel my despair. Now as I lay dying, my eyes hurt from the crying, the cold shadow of death upon me. I leave you with one last asked favor. When you give birth to our disease ridden stillborn baby, tell Junior I'm proud of him, and bury him next to me, maybe. Just buried. Her dead law for my inner child just got felt up by my inner priest. Another love letter to, Sharon Needles, good news, I got my reprieve last night. Just as the priest came into sight, I licked the AIDS, what a miracle, right? So let's hook up and have one of our opiate snack packs. Sound tight? It's been a while since you've had a fix. Come on over and I'll throw some of this dilated in the mix. Hypodermic injected hydromorphone hydrochloride, get that shit in the syringe and take ourselves a slow ride. We can drool and talk of old times. How I met you at the government cheese lines, the time I bailed you out of jail. After you were soliciting to some undercover cop named Dale. Positively discuss the case of HIV that you so thoughtfully gave to me. The little things that bother us when we ride that South Down H bus. Agitated by children laughing, and flowers growing. These little tidbits about you Sharon, I cherish knowing. When the needle breaks off in your arm, or how as a little girl that priest took your lucky charm. Don't worry Sharon that you'll get over, as the warm relaxing waves take over. You fight to keep one eye open, oh Sharon needles when I tell you about all the evils that priest talked about at the methadone clinic. Fuck that douchebag, he's nothing but a cynic. We made our bed and now we're lying, we'll share needles till the day we're dying. It may come soon you never know. The nurse at the free clinic said our white blood counts low. Before we die I hope you know, you mean so much to me, you dirty hoe. As we lay here weak and feeble, let's take this last chance to share an evil. Fiendishly, per dead law for I'm not legally insane, I'm just illegally sane. Sharon needles. It seems the only way to get to you is violence, and I employ it. You keep crossing the line, so you must really enjoy it. You're self-centered, and you have no compassion. For those matching black eyes, you were blatantly asking. When I spent 12 hours on the road, just to save you from that roach-infested hole. You treated me like a tool, a novelty item, you said those words, I'll recite them. I think it's best if you turn and go. So much going on here I just can't go. Puff, when all the plans we had, it fucking made me steaming mad. Around the neck, I put you in a choker, gouged out one eye with a red hot poker. Then you crossed me by not screaming, for that infraction you took a reaming. A baseball bat tart and dipped in glass, horridly tore apart your plump, round ass. You kept telling me about the help I need to seek, that got you bound and not dosed for a week. I gave you some water and one bowl of wishes, by day six you'd resorted to handfuls of urine, and fists of your feces. You made a good gimp, a freak on a leash. I should work as a pimp, I made a thousand that week. You started to look faint, 
and chewing draw the restraints. Your face turned blue, and your mouth started foaming. The crazy seizures started, and then the horse moaning. I knew it wasn't even cause of the donkey I had you boning. Your eyes turned red and your head began spinning. Reciting the Latin alphabet from end to the beginning, possessed by Lord Morpheus and by God was he winning. You grabbed the statue of Virgin Mary, your cunts where you stuck her. A guy at the donkey show was Christian, and right crossed you dead in the cocksucker. The donkey stick flopped out and your cunt leaped with its jism. We all looked at each other and agreed on an exorcism. Luckily one guy had a 12-step program pamphlet with him. Open to page 12 we began chanting on him. The sores on your arms erupted into a pustulous fountain, endless stream of cusses your mouth was a spot in. Green, mommy twos, stinking spew became a projectile. Holy drugs we inject you out this demon, well. At that point your track marks turned to crusty, the drugs took hold from our needles so trusty. The power of crust compels you, Sharon. We said, as you finally laid still on the bed. At long last you got your junky urge, and my justice had doubtlessly been served. Less than a week after all that helter skelter, you found yourself shacked up at the local battered women's shelter. Till you called me up, my forgiveness you were imploring, dot 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 when I get back I'll do the dishes first thing, cause I know that's what's best for me. And you're the king. Tag my turn being soft and sweet, but you prefer being kicked in the teeth. All the respect you think you deserve is paid to you when my back ends served. Thanks for the lesson Sharon, from now on in my opposite sex dealings, I'll no longer try and get in touch with their feelings. I'll just beat them so hard, three weeks they'll be healing. Hi viscosity anal lubes no more, I'll fuck that ass dry, and she'll be bleeding and sore. Each one the same, they come back for more. Takes a lot of brains to realize what a good thing you had. You all made me dead inside though, so I no longer feel bad. Disdainfully, her dead law for it ain't no miracle raising me up from the grave, but you better try. The saga continues. Hey there Sharon, heard you were feeling ill. So I brought you this pill, chicken soup, and anal lube. Just don't use my whole damn tube. Bend right over we all begin. Who says sodomy is a sin? When we're done, if you're still walking, do the dishes and the washing. Don't you whine and no demands, or I'll give you my back end. Wash your ass your pussy stinks, while you're down there scrub your stink. Shave your snatch it's goddamn hairy. Wait, there's a penis taped to your leg and in it that says your name is Laurie. Cool your jets, I'm just joking. Grab your needle it's time for a pokin. The shit I am holding is one hitter quitter, it grabs me by the balls and you by the shitter. Tag your fix and feeling better, so I will end this, my fifth love letter. Lover dead law for oompa loompa doompa dee dee. What do you get from a slug with VD? Love letter number sign 62, Sharon Needles, you know how I cherish my own time alone, to take care of the business I have with my bone. Only this morning I was going to town. Listening to music and punching my clown. The phone wouldn't stop ringing so I had the notion. It may have been important. So I put down my lotion. Picked up the receiver wondering who could it be. To hear a pre-recorded message about you from the CBC. It said, Oompa Loompa Doompa Dee Dee. What do you get from a slug with VD? Pain in your dick and blood in your pee? Sharon's been in again so you better get tested this week. What else is new Sharon? No more annoying calls, I have to get down to business and empty my balls. No sooner had I got to my turkey neck, another call came in and so I answered it. What the heck? It was the local cops, they called with a message. To let you know their sores were in dressage. You gave them, the drip, and Amazonian crow's nest crickets. Said you are lucky they're nice, they could all write you tickets. Their dicks and their assholes, they described how they bleed. They want you to know how it affects their summer softball league. They begged, they pleaded and we argued with strife. I told them you weren't here to explain to their wives. The sores and the drippage, the pain and the burning. I said, it's your own damn problem. Now a hard lesson you are learning. Click. I hung up, fuck those dirty pigs I was so pissed off I had to smoke three more cigs. Calm down, 
Then back to my own task at hand. My one ad trousers make that a venom spitting demand. I got me prepared to do some demon. Just right then another damn call came in. My dear lord, who can this be now? If it's not an emergency I'll give birth to a cow. It was Ruth, the assistant nurse from the sex change shop. Please give Sharon this message from Drive McDougal. Those spare parts came in and they are priced really quite frugal. For the small price of 11.99 and she can get those she putters attached to her spine. Then while you're at it, ask if she wants the penis we removed back, or if I can just have it. Yes, she's still Sharon from the block. She used to have a penis, but now she's got it what? It took me a while of getting to know your vagina. Guess I never noticed the tag that read, Made in China. Next time I see ya, you'll get a smack on the fanny. You could have just told me that you were merely a tyranny. It's ten after eleven, by then I've normally eaten, but the skinhead in my pants was still begging to be beaten. I regret not buying that message machine, cause the spunk in my nuts is now old and turning green. My balls are all blue from the messages I've taken, all your fucking friends and the demands that they're making. Quarantine messages from the CDC, not so well wishes from the boy at precinct 13. Ruth, the nurse from the local sex change shop, wanting to know what to do with your old cock. I told her exactly where she could stick it, right up her cunt with the Amazon crow's nest crickets. Finally ripped the phone out the walls, and sat down to attend to my poor swollen balls. Hand over fist, I beat it white knuckled, switched hands and gained a stroke, and then my knees buckled. Hell of a thing to see my fuck finally fly. Wish you were here I'd shoot it right in your eye. You'd probably talk and that would only spoil it, so I prefer my babies to die in the toilet. Manually, per dead law for final love letter, a bullet from my gun. Sharon Needles, I never meant for it to go this far, but you know you secured my little heart. Like Bonnie and Clyde you and me, at time we held up the pharmacy. You on crowd control, I took care of the clerk. I told him exactly how it did fucking work. Just get me the drugs, right fucking now nah boy, no cute shit, don't be some hero cowboy. Guess he wanted to die for a minimum wage, he wouldn't cooperate which brought on my homicidal rage. Smashed his teeth with the butt of my gun, he spit in my face, so I had me more fun. You brought me that girl of 18 or 19. About 6 months pregnant, oh what a fine teen. Said, dot 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 you see this whimpering little bitch. Now cause of you they'll find her dead in a ditch. Took my knife and cut away her maternity clothing. Did you see the look in her eye, the fear and the loathing? You told her how that really turns my crank. Now on your knees you slutty little skank. She cried to the clerk to give us our drugs. Dot 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 John single quote T you know you can't reason with thugs. Too late for her, the new fate was sealed. I forced her mouth open, remember how she squealed? Long and high pitched, the paint nearly peeled. She wouldn't cooperate, time was running low, so I took out my buoy and cut a new hole, bloody and raw, I stuck in my pole. A horrifying spectacle the hostages were appalled, then even more so, when you licked the blood from my balls. When you were through you rolled the bitch over, stomped on her belly, with the mercy of your shoe, a second life over. After the writhing, the final death throes, we heard the sirens, the pigs were in clothes. The clerk wised up, after losing his teeth. Gave me the combo to the safe and the keys. I got the oxycontin, morphine, dilated, dear. Now start that timer, it's time we got out of here. The plastics secured to the building with care, without question would dispatch of all the witnesses there. The last phase of our plan, getaway set in motion. I looked in your eyes and saw your devotion. The smoke grenade slyly covered the final destination of two renegade star-crossed lovers. You kept your cool in the hail of gunfire, took a bullet for your man, the dedication I so truly admire. Dragged you to the car, and we got away. I was soaked in your blood, much to my dismay. I ghost you up, and for your suffering to be done. The last love letter I wrote to you was a bullet from my own gun. Screamed up at heaven, swore my revenge. Ten dead pigs I give you Sharon, to make my amends. 
Do you forgive me, Sharon? Soon I will know, as your dead lover makes his last stroll down death row. Vengefully, her dead lover cuddled inside your warm comfy goose hole. Sharon Needles, funny how you say that you're a proud parent. All I can see is the neglect so inherent. Ten abandoned children in the state of Massachusetts, why couldn't you just take those loads on your massive to tits? I feel real bad for your firstborn named Ruth. She still lives happily with Abjaz Mopper from the PK booths. She cried when you didn't show up to court for any of the hearings for her child's support. The State Department of Family Services would greatly appreciate if you put an end to the activities you have with your cervixes. They are running short on caseworkers, the ones they have despise the daily tearjerkers. They have to tell every night when they come home to their wives, that Sharon Needles just ruins young lives. Another one of Sharon Needles' babies adopted, please think of the children, only you can stop this. How many of them will end up on the black market, like the one you left in the park did? Dozens of babies left in the dumpster, could have been prevented if only you'd taken it in the dumper. Don't get me started about all the abortions, or how you got custody of our kid and I got no portions. Money you made pandering our baby, Oxycontin 80s you got trading the food stamps to some lady. Poor little Timmy the one with four fathers, your bukkake sessions, he's the only one who got bothers. I sprung for the kid's DNA testing, couldn't bear to see him suffer not knowing, so I thought it the best thing. So like me your kids are all dead inside. They can't think of their estranged mother with any sense of pride. A message from them, they want you to know. Get your priorities straight and stop being a ho. Concerned, her dead law for P.S., I pray your next baby is a brown one in the toilet. Name it after me, okay? No? How about Johnny? Is he wearing a hat? Keep the crib juice asterisk in your caboose, hang loose by a noose, don't hunt a moose. But do a one-legged goose, I'm halt. Don't let your dingle dangle dangle in the dirt. Pick up your dingle dangle tie to your shirt. Love letter from Sharon Needles to Don Juan Dead Law for Hey Dead Lover, sorry I ain't answered your letters yet. I'm busy you know. Don't let your dingle dangle dangle in the dirt. Pick up your dingle dangle tie to your shirt. Right? That's what you always say, huh? Not sure what it means but I think it may be something like don't get your panties in a bunch over it. Oh yeah would you mind loaning me some money till I can get back on my knees again? I promise I'll buy Junior a lolly with some of it. Okay. Keep those hoes dead babe. Then the toothless ones do also give better blows. You dead pimp w slash a limp, but I don't give you sim cause you a gimp. That's the way you roll with your fat pole while you smoke a bull on a stroll on the grassy knoll. You keep your shit high till you die and squirm in a bitch's eye then tell her you want a chicken thigh in the sky. But don't die till you get your pot pie. Then she's got your permission, her lips you be kissin'. Her ex old man you be dissin', cause he missin' while he went fishin'. Then you strut for a slut and bust a gut when you nut in her butt in a hug with King Doot. So holla back when you crawl out of the sack, no you ain't shack or to pack, you ain't black, no sir you don't lack the length of your dink, I want it in my sphinct. Lover you so crazy, my looks sure amaze thee as well a drive you crazy. I'll step off you ain't Miss Daisy. No not that old prune driven around by some darky goon. What his name? I mean Denzel washing machine. No it's that Freeman. The only thing white about him is his semen. I pray to my demon protect me, give me the strength to end this long love letter so I can finally shoot up and feel better. As I say by I say cause I'm the apple of your eye and I miss your just running down my warm soft thaw. Represented in the 06 by some chicks with fake dicks, oh I'm still trunny from the block used to have a penis and now I have it what? That's what I thought as this love letter I shot to my lover who rots as he grabs his thick brat for a maggoty gum shot. Oh I love it a lot. Now I'm outy like clam shouty, but don't get all potty or I'll have to get rowdy and send your ass off to Saudi. Peace out on the flight out dead pimp love tape. Violence in your head, knock on wood. If you could you should. Dead goes up, needles down. I'm out, sup, dripping, Sharon needles here comes the death metal gay donkey dick. 
Love letter number nine book Sharon Needles, dear Sharon Needles, it had been a while and you kept bragging up your honky tonk day donk donk. So I told you to get it ready for the death metal day donkey dick. I came down over and nearly got fucking sick. You had a shitload more junk in your trunk than I could have guessed or even funk. Took one look and damn, my junk had just shrunk. Now I think your ass has its own area code. And that's not where I wanna bury my load. I hate to sound cold, but you lied when you told me all the hype you had an average body type. Yeah, average for a telly to be, man is that belly chubby. Sure you're exercising and feeling lovely, but the truth is Sharon, you can't work off the ugly. Your face with the pock marks, make the babies cry in your trailer park. Just stick to the facts. Your face started on fire and someone tried putting it out with a pickaxe. This may hurt a lot, but when you were a baby your foster mom had to feed your ugly ass with a slingshot. So stop going around telling me you're hot, the truth is you're not. Ten acres of rainforest are clear cut each week, so you can wipe your left butt cheek. Each turd takes a fortnight, after you shit it for it sees the light and drops in the toilet. Your confidence I may spoil it. But my mind is recoiling in horror from the horrible reek emanating from your rotten hillbilly teeth. I tried using tact and offering you my Tic Tacs. Nope you wouldn't have that, and still were surprised when I pulled back from your unsolicited kiss. Got poked by that amboni you keep stored under your floppy tits, sorry that spare twinkie under your rolls got squished. All that said I feel better as I end this ninth love letter, it may have sounded rude and classless. This morgue pimp don't make pass ace and goes with fat asses. Honestly, her dead law for all I ever wanted was a BJ on my B-Day. Monday was my 28th birthday. This is a little rhyme that summarizes how I feel. I don't know how much more I can take God keeps shitting on my poor birthday cake Mom didn't get an abortion which was her first mistake Got pregnant the first time her virginity was taked 19 years of lying in the bed that she'd make light and said she Loved me and a smile she faked 28 years of lonely misery makes a man I hate so drinking and drugging seems to be then only path to take so go ahead god take your massive shit like every year I'll faithfully measure the size of it make sure in the middle of my cake you skillfully hit I'll eat it up and gladly wash it down with your piss another year of kicks in the teeth and dicks in the eye thanks for another shitty birthday you sick twisted guy I'll never bring a child into this world and now. You know why till the herd dead law for you get the curse so I get hit by the purse. Everyone seems to want a piece of me lately. What's gonna come next? Or, oh I had a creamy dream of you, well they're all waiting for me to reveal that prize behind the double doors that reach the heavens and what could it be? That one thing that will make you satiated for the rest of your lives. Something to ingrain me deeper into their psyches. Let's tell them what they've won Bob. A brand new. Top 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 dead lover asterisk applause asterisk he don't talk back, but he's good in the sack hung like he's half black, you slide on his shaft pole dancing on that morbid skin graft don't cry when it breaks off inside oh how the maggots rise blue, cold, supple lips, gently caress against your perky tits mangled, as your digits, skillfully frig out your engorged club bitch necroorgasmic waves, all through your body babe that lottery scrotum skin, rests gently upon your chin maggot bukkake sessions, twisted sadistic torture lessons grotesque personality, undocumented necromedies strict rules or fun screws, piss him off and he'll draw and quarter you. Legions of dead hoes with snake covered cornrows thick lottery dicks so big in diameter a corpse will split pandering the post mortem, you slab them he'll sport them hanging the toe tags, Trying dead sluts out with tea bags the misbegotten baby butcher, OBGYN perversion pusher petrified gigolo. To get to him you gotta dig a hole get right down and taste the mold. A decaying memory.